Very good. Um, this brings us to the next uh, presentation, which is by Ian Bates, the man that needs no further introduction, but still some words. Um, Ian is uh, a marketing director for uh, Two Sides, well-established organization promoting uh, fibers and circularity of fibers in the in packaging and uh, paper industry. And he's also a co-founder of Fiber Pack. Um, so Ian, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Right, here we go. Um, today I'm gonna to talk to you about the future of plant-based molded fiber packaging, but I'm gonna, first of all, start off with a story. <laughs> I was about 10, 11 years old, and my first job was a paper boy, which for those of you who don't know what a paper boy is, is a boy that delivers, and girls do it as well, papers to people's homes. And what I realized after doing this job for several months is that if I collected the newspapers and magazines on my go car, and every fortnight we stuff them into the back of my mum's minivan, I could turn that waste into today one car load was about 150 euros, which was probably about. 10 times what I was getting paid to do the paper round. Little did I realize all of these 20 or so years later, I would be still working in the world of fiber. Anyway, that's how I got going. I thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> I'm gonna first of all, start off with a question. Who in the room before today had heard of two sides? Show of hands, please. Okay, we're really doing a bad job, aren't we? Oh dear. <laughs> Okay, at least you know, as of today, you'll know a bit about Two Sides. So Two Sides, strange name I know, is a not-for-profit. It was founded in 2008. Um, it was actually born out of the paper merchanting and graphics industry um, and has grown into this huge glo global organization. We now have, have over 600 member partners, some are in the room, and we operate in most of European countries, North America, Canada, South where you can see the green areas. We're not operating in Asia yet, but we are getting lots of inquiries. And the purpose of, well, first of all, it's funded. It's a membership model, and it's funded by the paper, pulp, paper packaging and tissue industry. We do three main things. We tackle misleading statements, better known as greenwashing. Um, things like, uh, don't print off this email, save a tree, uh, go to online billing, uh, save a forest. We probably already all have those on the bottom of our emails. Out of interest, has anybody got that on the bottom of their email right now? Even if you did, you probably wouldn't put your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> that is technically greenwashing. And under the Green Claims Code, in Europe, that is not allowed. Anyway, so we go after, it's mostly utility companies, banks, and many other companies. And we, we write to them politely and say, look, you really can't say that or do that. Withdraw. And roughly 50% of the companies we contact do comply. The others just ignore us. And we then take steps. But we try to avoid legal action. Now, to support this uh, anti-greenwashing nonsense, we have something called Love Paper. Now, Love Paper is hugely supported by the publishing industry. If you pick up a newspaper or a magazine or something, and you see that logo that is aimed at consumers to take them to a multi-language website to try and communicate the facts about forestry, and where paper comes from, and the fact that Every time you use a piece of paper product, you're not destroying forests. I'll come on to what consumers really think in a minute, and you might be shocked. And the other thing we do is we provide lots of facts and information. There's some great stuff on the website, which is freely available. Check it out, um, website, twosides.info. Uh, you might find it useful. Okay. What does that graph tell you? Well, we asked over 10,000 
people, I hate to call them consumers, 10,000 people globally, what they think is happening to our forests. And that specifically the question was around European forests. It's important to make that um, uh, statement. Shockingly, only 15% of consumers believe forests are growing in area. I have to define that. Of course, they're growing, but expanding in area, only 15%. So 85% think they're shrinking or they don't know. The reality is forests in Europe are actually growing and they're growing at 1,500 football pitches, the equivalent area, every single day. Amazing, isn't it? You probably knew that anyway, didn't you? I'm sure you did. Anyway, the other question we asked them was how much paper and paper packaging is recycled? And we, are, we, we were specific around the question saying how much is over 60%? And again, only 18% of consumers think that the paper and paper packaging industry is recycling over 60%. Really worrying when you think that the reality is these are SEPI, uh, this is SEPI data, so it's correct. 82% of paper packaging is actually recovered and, in, and recycled. If we just take paper, it's around about 74%. So we've got a lot of work to do. Although when you ask consumers, which do you prefer, uh, plastic, glass, metal, Interestingly, paper always comes out on top, well, mostly comes out on top. And for reasons listed there, it's compostable, it's biodegradable, it's perceived to be better for the environment, um, it's lighter weight, less expensive, easy to recycle. Now, we ask a whole series of different questions to try and untangle what people really think. Now, obviously, you could ask consumer things, how they think and how they behave can be very different, of course. But generally speaking, the consumer prefers paper to certainly single-use plastic. We know that. Of course, the, there is a confusion amongst consumers. They've been bombarded by these messages for years and years and years about uh, don't use paper. You know, I can remember at school, teachers telling me, you know, save paper, you know, save a forest. It's all nonsense. We have to de-link somehow deforestation, which is horrific. If you look at the numbers there, 1 billion hectares in 40 years has been removed off the planet. And just in the last 40 years, half of the world's rainforest has been destroyed. But it's got nothing to do with the paper industry. So, alternative fibers. Now, it may seem strange that somebody working for two sides uh, is essentially representing the forestry product sector is going to now talk about alternative fibers. The plot will thicken, I promise you. So there are lots, and we've heard today from Olga and various other people, there are lots of different fibers that are being played around with, but the most common ones are bagasse, bamboo. I mean, certainly if you go to Asia, it's mostly bagasse, which is the name for waste from the sugarcane plants, bamboo, um, and other, other fibers. And miscanthus. Who's heard of miscanthus? Again, show of hands. Or elephant grass. Okay, a few. All right. And then we see some interesting things where agri waste, um, I mean, Waitrose, but you probably heard of the UK retailer, very uh, posh retail, retail, UK retailer. They are mixing tomato leaves with uh, corrugated fiber waste to make. Tomato punnets, great story. Um, we're going to see more and more of that, I'm sure. We've talked earlier in the Q&A uh, before lunch about um, what are the important considerations for alternative fibres. And I think we've, we've probably flushed it all out, but the key things are location. You, know, you don't really want to be transporting fibre or finished product thousands of miles, which is what we're doing at the moment. You really want your conversion. You want your you want your plant or your your crop 
on location and then thermoforming it or pulping it and thermoforming it as close to the site as possible. So I'm also a director and co-founder of a company called Fiberpack. Chris is also uh, one of the owners. Um, Fiberpack's an interesting one. We started this out, what, two years ago? Uh, we've just raised the funding and a lot of money. And we've, before we've even produced a single product, we've just done a JV with one of the largest plastic um, manufacturing groups. I can't, I won't say where it is because it wouldn't be fair, but they are huge. And we go live with production probably middle of next year. First factory will be in Lincolnshire, uh, which is uh, the potato capital of the United Kingdom. <laughs> and um, why is it there? Well, it's right in the middle of a location that grows an awful lot of miscanthus. And at, on the same site, the landowner, who's also an owner of Fiber Pack, has an anaerobic digester which at the moment is being powered by agri-waste. But the idea is that we will create bioenergy out of the machine because these machines are very energy intensive, aren't they, Olga? They use a lot of watts. So we want to be able to produce clean energy on site and then power the kit to make uh, as near to possible carbon neutral products. We'd like to be carbon negative, actually. Um, we'll see. Um, the other big issue around alternative fibers is scalability um, and viability. You know, it's we look at uh, recycled corrugated waste. What's the price today, Chris? Hundred pounds a ton? Probably not even that. Yes. Well, let's say it's a seventy-five euros a ton. You know, so you're competing with those kind of uh, financial metrics. Um, when you get into a virgin fiber for direct food contact, um, obviously it's a different uh, cost profile. But whatever fiber you use, it has to be cost effective. And then there's the question of will the paper mills take this stuff back and put it back into paper? Uh, in theory, it's made from cellulose, so it should be technically possible. But that doesn't mean the paper mills will take it back. It was interesting to hear from uh, our, uh, I can't remember his name, gentleman from store, Enso. Are you here? Yes. It's interesting to hear from you this morning saying that the paper mills generally pretty flexible about fiber, but to how much, you know, to what degree, and is every paper mill uh, accepting of alternative fibers? We'll see. Whatever, they will have to be certified, they have to be repulpable, and they'll have to be uh, independently signed off. Then we have the environmental and social uh, issues. Now, with wood pulp, we have FSC, PSC, or SFI in the US. Um, we don't have that system for plant based fibers. We've got something in the UK called Red Tractor. Um, but how do we? Uh, make sure that the supply chain is not compromised in any way. There has to be traceability, there has to be accountability, there has to be uh, uh, consideration for all environmental and social impacts. So we're trying to figure out how, how to do that um, with help from uh, consultants, etc. And then we've got the issue of additives. Um, which we're grappling with um, because like any uh, material like a pulp, um, the, it needs, if you're gonna, if it's gonna have a direct food contact with a greasy product or a moist product, it's gonna have to have some sort of coating or a film or something, but obviously not PFAs or any of those other nasty chemicals. So, um, Told you that already. Fiber Pack is going to be in a place called Boston in Lincolnshire. The operational next year, uh, be powered by agri waste. So we're limited by the amount of tons of miscanthus that we'll initially have, only for the simple reason that there's not enough of it being grown. In the UK, 
Uh, we've got access at the moment to about 20,000 tonnes, which is peanuts. Um, and that will grow. As demand grows, then um, there will be a consideration for, for growing more land, not growing more land, growing more crop. Um, I'll tell you more about the crop in a second. Uh, website's fiberpack.com, by the way, if you want to have a, have a look. So what is Miscanthus? It's a perennial um, non-food sustainable crop. It is the second fastest growing plant on the planet. The first, the most fast, the fastest is bamboo. And it's planted from a rhizome. That's a rhizome up in the top right-hand corner. And what's interesting about it is it's a non-invasive plant, so it doesn't like bamboo, it doesn't spread everywhere, which can cause a problem. But you can leave these rhizomes in the ground for 20 to 30 years, which is important because that means you're going to keep the carbon locked up. Um, they, the crop requires little or no um, pesticides or fertilizer. It needs a little bit of potash. Um, it, produce, uh, yeah, it produces very high yields of biomass because of the very fast growing rate. And it's a C4 plant, don't you know? A C4 plant is quite interesting. It doesn't require nitrogen to grow. Um, and therefore, when it is water stressed, it doesn't release CO2 back into the atmosphere. Now, the majority of plants on the planet and trees are C3. So when they're water stressed, they release the CO2 back into the atmosphere. And also, if there is a forest, a, a field fire, um, because the rhizome is about five or six inches under the soil, it doesn't get destroyed. So uh, good to know. And the great thing is it will grow in pretty much any soil. So it can go, it'll grow on marginal land, second grade uh, contaminated land even. In fact, Miscanthus is also used to uh, clean soil, to re-fertilize soil. And um, yeah, it sequests carbon back into the soil because you're not plowing up the field. And by the way, we can mechanize the planting of the rhizomes. And when we come to cut the crop, as you can see there, we're using a combine harvester. So it's all high speed. Uh, the tech's already there. Um, it's, it's low cost. Now, obviously, these combiners, combine harvesters run on diesel, which is not perfect, but you know, ultimately, these things will be run by solar-powered robots, probably. Who knows? We'll see. That's what the crop looks like. Has anybody ever seen Miscanthus or walked through a Miscanthus field? It's great. It's amazing. I mean, look how tall it is. That is why it's called elephant grass, because it grows so high. It, it started its life out in Asia. And its full name is Miscanthus ex gigantius. Bit of Greek or Latin or something. Is it Greek, probably? Um, so it's planted um, in April, and then it's harvested um, roughly a year later. And it takes about two years to get to a point where it's productive enough to uh, to get any yield, essentially. These are some of the end uses. I mentioned energy. 95% of miscanthus at the moment is being burned. Pretty crazy, because of course you're releasing the CO2 back into the atmosphere. This is used a lot for soil regeneration. Uh, it can be used for second generation bioethanol. Um, it can be used for uh, byproducts such as uh, lignin and other uh, microcellulose, etc. It's used for animal bedding, um, molded fiber packaging, of course. It can be used for uh, viscose, making viscose for textiles. It's already being used um, well, as in development for use for making building products such as miscrete. And we're in the development phase of turning it into paper and board. Although given our limitations in terms of tonnage, that's probably going to be a um, less of a priority. But we'll see. So it's a, it's a cradle to cradle, pretty virtuous um cycle um and because within the group we control the, the growing of the crop um so we don't have any ip 
what we do have is control over the growing of the crop. And our partners, who are also investors in the business, control around about 90% of the um, miscanthus that's grown in the UK currently. And there are plans to extend that across uh, other parts of the world. Um, and on site, there will be energy production, thermoforming, pulp moulding. There'll be one thermoforming unit to probably six to 12 thermoforming units. And we're just in the sort of final stages of deciding which technologies to adopt, which is why being here was quite relevant. Um, and interestingly, we've got clients that already want to place orders, which is great. Um, but also what they want to do is they want to grow the crop on their land. So we've got very large produce growers that also want to grow miscanthus. So they have the story of we grow our own packaging, we prep the product in the, our own packaging, and the plan would be to then have this virtuous loop from cradle to cradle. And we can, if we, if, if we can get the packaging back, we can also put it back into the energy plant. That's not quite so easy, of course. Um, if it's in a, a closed environment, like a, I don't know, a stadium or something, it might work, um, but certainly out of home or through sort of domestic waste collection, that is not so easy. But if it's food contaminated, it doesn't matter, it just goes straight back into the, uh, the digester, assuming it's not contaminated, of course. Yeah, so that's the process. Now, the last thing to really depress you, we have talked a lot about contaminants over the last day and a half or so. You all know about the Dupont story, I'm sure. Tell me if you haven't. Anybody not heard the Dupont story? Show of hands, please. Nobody heard the Dupont story. You're kidding me. Nobody has heard the Dupont story. You know the Dupont story. The PFA. Yeah. Okay. I assume you would. If you haven't, watch this film called Dark Waters. It was released, I think, 20, 2019 or 2020. Um, it's the story about how uh, PFOAs were developed to coat tanks and then went on to coat frying pans, and carpets, curtains, clothing, packaging, and on and on and on. And of course, we know it's an amazing material. It's, it's a very complex molecule. I'm not a chemist, by the way. There's plenty of chemists in the room here. So I'm not going to explain the chemistry to you, but I do know this. Once this damn stuff is in the water system, and in the food chain, in our bodies, you don't get rid of it. So it is a problem. And it does worry me that the packaging industry, packaging industry is still using this stuff. And if I had my magic wand, I'd ban it immediately. We have to find an alternative and it is an imperative to do so. Um, because, you know, interestingly, uh, DuPont, which is now owned by Dow Chemicals, uh, is facing a lot of legal claims. Um, they're up to, I don't know, about two billion so far, dollars, US dollars. Uh, the pundits reckon it'll get to over 200 billion claim, claims. It's a very serious situation, and it is completely out of control. So that I've cheered you all up. Um, <laughs> What does this mean for the packaging sector? Well, quite simply, um, there are lots of great things going on in the world of fibre packaging, and there's lots of challenges. But what we've got to be ever so careful is that we don't get sucked into easy fixes. So the sooner we can develop natural, uh, non-toxic, safe, alternatives to PFOAs, the better. Um, thank you very much for listening. I haven't bored you to tears. Uh, have you got any questions? <laughs> thank you, Ian. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Oh, not you. <laughs> Hi, Ian. Tim Hello. from Procter & Gamble. <laughs> I was curious about the the two side, if you do life cycle analysis for paper and have compared it to plastics or other pieces. Um, we are doing that. 
um, we will do lots of LCAs, and uh, but we haven't completed the work yet. And we can't complete it until the factory's built. We've, we've started the structure of the building, and until everything is complete, there's no point starting the. We can do theoreticals, and we have done theoreticals actually, but um, they need to be independently verified. So it's work in progress. Okay, so I was I was thinking more in context to the two side where you're tackling oh, these misleading sorry. statements. Oh, Have sorry. you done life cycle analysis no. in the context? No, we don't do LCAs. Okay. No, no, no we, uh, we don't get into all of that. We'll leave that to SEPI. <laughs> Helpful, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lobbying government and technical stuff, we leave to SEPI. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is Ana Maria from Montemagui. So yeah. I'm curious. You mentioned that you do some greenwashing. Exactly. I don't do greenwashing. <laughs> I'm fighting. To others, to others, to others. Not not <laughs> at, uh, well, yeah. what you what you do. But then I'm curious, like, if you do it through audiences to the other companies, or how do you do it? How do we do it? Yeah. Really simple. We write to the uh, CEO and usually head of compliance. And then we don't hear from them for a few months. And then we chase them, and then we might get a response. It, it, it's amazing, actually. Just in the last three months, we've noticed that people are starting to take this matter a bit more seriously because they realize that this green claim code, and if you haven't read it, it's boring as heck, but read it. Um, it's important. It's really important. You know, there's a lot of distrust out there. And... Um, you know, we have to make sure that we hold companies to account. And most of these companies are really big uh, companies. And often they don't, haven't done it intentionally. They made a mistake. You know, the marketing department, you know, wrote a stupid thing and it wasn't fact-checked. So. I hope that answers your question. Yep. Um, sorry. Um, question about using non-food crops we, yep. we sort of have you know we, we do things with sugar beet we've had questions in the past about are you replacing you know, land that would be good food. growing food does that limit the amount of things like mis miscanthus that you can potentially grow um certainly in the uk anyway yeah i mean obviously in the uk we're pretty limited for the land full stop um generally no because we can grow miscanthus on land that you couldn't grow a crop. Um, and there are also incentives for farmers and landowners to grow miscanthus. Um, why, are not, why are more farmers not growing it? I think they don't know about it. You know, word hasn't got out there yet. Um, but it will. I think it's about supply and demand. Anybody else? Um, have you guys done an analysis between the environmental impact um, between growing trees for fiber versus um, the short growing crops? Because miscanthus sounds um, better than a lot of others because it's um, it doesn't need as much like the pesticides and that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, but it does need the extra mechanized farming demand yeah. and it needs its own special watering systems then for growth. And then the no. root system isn't as deep as the um, trees. And how does that then affect problems like erosion in certain areas? Like I said at the beginning, I'm not a technical guy, but Chris might be the answer to that. So I'll save you. Um, <laughs> the answer that one of my colleagues would be able to answer that. Um, I did actually have in my slide something about uh, comparing sequest sequestering of carbon tree versus miscanthus, but I think it's too washy, greenwashy. Um, it needs to be science-based and it needs to be independently done. Otherwise, I'm, it can't be considered. Um, in terms of what you said about water, there's no irrigation used to grow uh, miscanthus. Um, now, obviously, it won't grow in very dry climates. It will grow in pretty cold climates. It's been grown in Norway, for example. Um, you're not from Norway, are you? No. Um, but grow it in Spain might be a bit of a toughie, although there are strains of miscanthus that are being developed that are, are tolerant to pretty much any uh, weather uh, situation. 
you know, genetic modification, which could be another issue, right? Anybody else? I won't buy. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Bit of applause. Thank you.